thanks guys hope you can see me um uh, thank you for the introduction and thanks Jai, for a great talk um the the purpose of my talk is to talk a little bit more about slabs and proximal biceps tenodesis or tenotomies and the reason i we do that is that it's actually a relatively common procedure um, that we do in shoulder surgery and quite often um you know, physios and GPs appreciate what we do, uh, but a lot of them may not completely understand exactly what we do. And I think it's important to, to just go through it and say how we repair it and why we repair it, because it actually influences how we uh, treat patients afterwards and rehab them as well. So uh, in addition to working in the Harley Specialist Hospital and being part of the OS group, I'm a consultant at the Royal London Hospital, which is part of Bots Health, one of the biggest, Europe's biggest trauma center right now. Um, going straight into recap of the anatomy, which Jag has already mentioned, um, the picture on the right is actually um, quite useful to see, okay? It shows you the long head of the bicep tendon, okay? Um, in one picture, you can see actually that right at the top of the glenoid, the biceps attaches uh, around the 11 o'clock and 12 o'clock position. So quite high up on the glenoid. In fact, where it attaches is actually, is actually part of the labrum. It's very hard to differentiate between the labrum and the biceps itself. And that's what we call the biceps anchor. And then, then the biceps does a really funny thing, right? It, it, in the arm, with the arm by your side, the biceps appears to do this 90 degree bend at the position which is marked as one. And then it goes down the groove. Now, obviously it looks like a 90 degree bend, but to be honest, if you're a bird or some other mammal, it will be in a completely straight line. Um, but in humans, that kind of 90 degree bend puts the biceps at quite significant risk. Because as you saw from the um, slides that Jack presented that just on either side of it are components of the rotator cuff, i.e. subscapularis in anterior to it and superior to it, you have the supraspinatus. So these structures can be at risk if something happens to the biceps. Um, men tend to have more biceps problems uh, presenting to us and the common age is between the age of 40 and 50. Now, I've seen loads of patients tear even the proximal biceps with a sudden heavy force, but usually it's a chronic problem. Now, what I like to say and remind everybody is when we talk about biceps, isolated biceps pathology is completely uncommon, right? So the tendon itself hardly causes a problem, but it often exists with other problems. So the biceps becomes painful when you have a slap tear. Um, bice, and then you have an instability issue. Quite often, if you have a biceps pulley lesion, i.e. a structure which keeps the biceps in place as it comes out of the rotator interval, if you have problems with that, then the biceps, which is a big strong tendon, can, do, can be unstable and can do what's called windscreen vipering and actually start cutting into and cheese wiring into the tendons around it, i.e. the subscapularis and the supraspinatus. So in that situation, the biceps is a cause of the problem resulting in cuff problems. And similarly with arthritis, um, whether it's um, osteoarthritis or rotator cuff arthropathy, the biceps tendon can get quite inflamed. So patients may present with lots of different biceps problem, but often they are issues with other parts of the shoulder. Hence, the reason that when we address patients surgically, when we have to, the biceps often needs to be addressed to resolve the issues. So, biceps has intra-articular, intra-groove, sub-groove problems, and the pathology can be anywhere. And as noted before, you know, the cuff, as well as the slap, is often where the biceps is involved in creating problems. Now, obviously, sometimes a biceps can be a problem by itself. This is very rare, okay? So occasionally you had this hourglass deformity on the biceps, 
or you could have a anatomical variant where you have a bifurcate long head of the tendon biceps. You do enough shoulder surgery, you'll see these, right? Um, but these are quite rare. So history and examination has we've gone through before, but just to recap, the, the examination and the history is often of pathologies related to the biceps, whether slap or cuffs and so on. And quite often these tests that are specific biceps are neither specific or nor sensitive. And, and if you ask me what is the most important thing in actually figuring out what the problem is with the patient, it is the history. 60, 70% of the information comes from there. And a little bit comes from the examination and even less comes from the ultrasound or the MRI scan, which is really there to confirm your diagnosis. So I'm gonna talk about slaps and when to fix it. The, the answer people ask me is often ask me, when do you do a tenodesis and when do you do slap? Well, actually, the answer is actually very simple. Forget everything about age and whatever the you know, literature says, 30 or 30, because it all points down to the same thing. If you want to do a slap repair, you have to be pretty sure that it is an isolated superior labrum problem, i.e. a slap problem. So slap obviously stands for superior labrum anterior posterior. So if the top kind of hood of the labrum has detached from the glenoid, whether by itself or in associated with a further labral pathology extending anteriorly and posteriorly, and there's nothing else going on with the shoulder, then you can do a slap. But sometimes if you have a slap tear, and then the tendon itself is windscreen vipering and causing damage to the subscapularis or the supraspinatus, then those tendons of the cuff, which are much more important, are a risk. So in those cases, we might just do a biceps tenotomy or tenodesis, i.e. get the biceps out of the equation, fix it away from the main shoulder joint, so it stops causing trouble. So that's simply how we do it. Now I have a little brief video on how we do it because you know people often wonder when we are doing these surgeries what is involved so this is an animation where we have a slap tear involving the top you know um, equator of the um, glenoid you can see it's the, the labrum is detached and quite simply what we end up doing is passing a few stitches around the labrum preparing the bed for healing and then taking these devices called anchors and just putting it down. It's just like you know putting a tent down, you have pegs that can fix it. Now in reality, this is what it looks like. So this is one of my cases, patient is sitting in a beach chair position and I'll show you some important pathology here. So that is the subscapularis, that's what it looks like. And that's the HH stands for the humeral head. So I'm looking inside the shoulder from the back. Now, Pretty soon what you'll see is the me testing the subscapularis to make sure it's fine. And if the subscapularis was torn, so I'll pause it there for a second if I can. So this is a very important screenshot. So what you have is the LHB, which is a bicep tendon in the joint. The SSP is a supraspinatus and HH is the humeral head. Now this guy, you'll see a little bit later on, has a complex slap tear, i.e. superior labrum is gone, anterior is gone, and the posterior is gone. But I'm making an effort right now to look at the subscapularis and the supraspinatus and just making sure that the biceps and the biceps pulley is intact. Now, if I was here and I found out that the supraspinatus anterior edge was being abraded or was being torn by the biceps, I'll be thinking that if even if I have to repair the labrum, I will not be just leaving the biceps as it is because you're still putting the tendons of the rotator cuff at risk. Now, in this particular case, as you can see, the supraspinatus looks pristine, subscapularis looks pristine. So this is an isolated slap problem. Now, this is different parts of the shoulder. So I thought I'd put this there. So People understand what we see inside the shoulder. This, that was the inferior ligaments. You're still seeing humeral head. And now you'll see a dent at the back of the head, which is HS is the Hillsack's deformity. When the shoulder dislocates, you have that. And then HH is a normal humeral head. 
And now you're going to see the superior labrum. So what I'm debriding right now is the superior labrum. That's the anterior labrum. And this gentleman has a posterior labrum tear as well. You can see it completely being detached from there. Now, fixing that is pretty simple, right? You can do whatever you need, right? But all you got to do is pass stitches in the right place around the ligaments, okay? And then put them onto these devices called anchors. And you got to place those anchors into the bone. So I've already passed the stitch. And now what I'm doing is drilling a hole. And this looks massive, but the actual hole is less than 2.9 millimeters. And nowadays we even use smaller ones. Again, that looks pretty big, but it is 2.9 millimeters wide. And as you can see, I took the stitch and I placed that peg into the bone to stabilize the labrum. And what you'll see is me doing a, what's called rinse and repeat. So every time the labrum is torn, wherever it's torn, I'm fixing it. And quite often you use one, two, three anchors, but this happened to be a pretty large tear um, and I'm repairing it all around. Now, this is me passing some sutures around the posterior labrum. Once again, these wires, called, uh, threads called fiber wire is being passed around. I'm moving position from a, one side of the shoulder to the other side. This can make every feel very dizzy if you're not doing it yourself. Um, but the process is pretty much the same. So we're drilling a hole and you'll see me placing the anchor again. Now in this case, what I've done is I've repaired the posterior extension of the labrum as well as the anterior extension. And now what we're left with is the pure slap. And you'll see that in a second when, I, when the camera moves around. So now I'm looking at the pure slap, still detached. You can see it's still very unstable, passing more stitches around it. This is a stitch right at the 12 o'clock position on top. And then I'm gonna be fixing this again in a similar fashion to what we did before. And finally, what you'll see is me finishing off by putting in these five different anchors. So th this is a, for anybody who's interested and, in, you know, to appreciate what it actually looks like, this is how we repair a typical slap. So we do a tenotomy, which is just cut the, when, because it's easy, but some people can get some groove pain, muscle aches. But to be honest, it's a very well tolerated operation worldwide. Some people may not like the cosmetic deformity that comes in because they can get a sign called a Popeye sign. So if you cut your long hair of the tendon biceps, it can bunch up on your arm. Some people love it because they get a nice little peak to their biceps, but some people don't like it. So, you know, in, if you're in France, pretty much everybody does a tenotomy. Uh, but in UK and worldwide, because it is so easy and takes a few minutes to fix it, we are now moving to doing a tenodesis if we do have to cut the biceps. So we cut it and refix it. Now, the biceps, as you saw from the uh, pictures, has a long um, length along the groove. And there is in descriptions of fixing it on top of the groove, middle of the groove, um, you know, and below the level of the pec major. So there are lots of different places where you can fix it. Now, a lot of people swear by fixing on the top of the groove. There are some people who put it in the middle of the groove and published results by the best guys in the world are always good. But what happens in practice is that if you look at the revision rates, that in some series we find that if you do it on top of the groove, the revision rates to change that to under the groove is higher. Now, what does that mean? Well, the theory is that 
sometimes the biceps pathology may exist in the groove as well. So if you just fix a tendon on top of the groove, um, you are ignoring the problems that can happen within the groove. So to make it really, really predictable, my technique is that I tend to, if I do a biceps tenodesis, I tend to fix it where we call it sub-pec. So you make a small axillary incision. We've cut the biceps already, the long head in the shoulder. We deliver it out. We whip stitch it. We pass a little stitch through the button. And then what we'll be doing is drilling a hole into the humerus just at the lower border of the pec major and fixing it. Now that gives you pretty much anatomical tension and length. So as far as the patient is concerned, they feel no different in their biceps shape or muscle power or anything at all. But what this allows us to do is make sure that if there's pathology anywhere along the groove or in the joint, it takes care of all of them. So it's a very predictable operation. In practice, this is what it looks like. So I've got a, it's a very small incision and you'll see me now deliver this tenotomized biceps out of the groove. So there's the biceps. I'm pulling on the long head. Once it's out, as shown in the animation, I stitch it. And the stitching is, you know, very firm. You know, the, the way we stitch it is not going anywhere. And then what we do is we drill a hole in the bone and you can see the pin there. And now I'm making a slightly bigger hole to fix the biceps in because the biceps is uh, big in this case. And sometimes in young people, the bone's really hard. So you can see me struggling a little bit. But once the hole is done, we put the stitch on this thing called a button. And now we're taking the button and we are transferring it to the other side of the bone, the humerus. We flick the button and then we pull on the sutures and essentially this biceps is now fixed onto the humerus in a new position, ignoring all the different pathologies in the groove in the shoulder. And in the end, you can see that the hole is pretty cosmetic. Uh, I've made it small enough so I can just barely fit my finger. Unfortunately, I can't make it smaller than that. So in summary, we do a slab repair when there's no other biceps pathology, especially if there's no cup pathology. So isolated slabs, we can fix it. In other cases, problems with biceps, we are doing a tenodesis. And that does depend on pathology. All locations are fine, but in my view, I'm, my preference is sub -pec because it's the most predictable and reliable way of sorting out all biases pathology. So with that, I will take any questions if there are any. In the meantime, I'll ask um, Roger to load up. Thank you. Perfect. Jag, you can hear? Yes, I can. I think there was a question now uh, that I saw. There's a question uh, saying, love the animation. Do you feel the sub pec is then also subjected to your rehab protocols? Mm -hmm. So when I first started doing sub pecs about six or seven years ago, I would allow full range of motion because that's when the stress is. There's no stress at the um, sub pec button from the shoulder point of view because it's no longer connected to the shoulder. Um, now, the shoulder rehab depends on what else we've done the shoulder. But suppose we've done an isolated bicep tenodesis, then I used to protect the elbow. So all I used to say is full range of motion, but no active or resisted supination or flexion. But more recently, I've just even said to forget that as well. Because the biceps fixation with the button in the sub-pec region is so strong 
that you lose more by stopping patients from moving. So I allow them to do active work, allow them to do some resistant work, but what I tell them is to be sensible with it. So for the first three or four weeks, I'll tell them not to do something silly like opening heavy jars or lifting heavy weights, but normal day-to-day -day function is completely fine, completely active, no issues with that at all. Thank you. Okay, if there are no more questions, I'm, I'm happy to start. So um, I'll talk about uh, biceps tendon ruptures, uh, dif uh, different to uh, what we heard before. This is uh, only about the elbow, of course. I'm a designer with Acumet, and I'm a designer of this uh, XO elbow brace, which is going to be distributed by Lida in, uh, in the UK pretty soon, hopefully. So biceps tendon pathology, you can have a bursitis. as a bursa surrounding the biceps tendon. There can be a, a tendinopathy. Um, you can have a rupture, and the rupture can be partial or can be complete. Despite of the previous video, video, these are the more uh, common patients with biceps tendon ruptures. So middle-aged men, uh, the dominant arm is involved in 85%, and as you can see, it's an eccentric loading. So loading against resistance and the biceps tendon um, um, ruptures. There are some predisposing factors and some of these may have played a role in the previous video. There's smoking, uh, anabolic steroid use or abuse. Um, this is a tuberosity spur, as you can see here on the, on the image, you see the tuberosity, which is normally quite nice, nicely rounded. In this case, there. obviously we don't know what's first. Maybe biceps and pathology is first, or maybe the bone uh, changes are first, but this is predisposing to a rupture. So if you see this, um, you have to think about biceps and problems. And then previous symptoms. Many of these patients will have had some type of previous symptoms in the, in the last few years if you ask them about it. The diagnosis of, of a complete biceps tendon rupture is actually relatively easy. It's clinical. This is the hook test that was described by Sean O'Driscoll. And you ask the patient to look at their own hand while they're abducting the shoulder, supinating the forearm, elbows in about 90 degrees, and you hook the biceps tendon behind your finger. And that should always be possible. Even in big, big people, you can still hook that biceps tendon. If you're not 100% sure, you can go to the other side and try it on the healthy side as well. Diagnostically, most of these patients will have heard or will have felt a pop, similar to, for example, an Achilles tendon rupture. And if you have a, a history of a pop while lifting or while eccentric loading, for example, something heavy falls, they try to catch it and then they feel something, they feel the biceps tendon give way, well, then probably the hook test will be possible. Resisted flexion is something that uh, most people will test, but quite often it's still quite, quite good because the brachialis is actually the more stronger uh, flexor of the elbow. So the biceps, you can resist quite a lot of force, especially those big people can resist quite a lot of force with their uh, flexion, uh, despite the, the biceps tendon ruptured being, uh, biceps tendon being ruptured. Resisted supination is more difficult, but this is often missed, especially at the ER patients, uh, the uh, ER docs don't tend to uh, feel the resisted supination and see if there's any problems there but the bicep is a very strong supinator. And uh, if you have weakness on supination, there might be a problem with your bicep tendon. And then palpation, sometimes you can actually feel the stump, especially when it's pulled up. There's a squeeze test, a form rotation sign and a Popeye sign, and there's a lag sign. We'll talk about that a little bit in a second. Uh, Popeye sign is being uh, misused by uh, shoulder surgeons, as we heard before in, in, in both previous talks. Popeye's are, uh, bicep actually goes up, it doesn't go down. So it's, uh, I think shoulder search should start talking about reverse Popeye sign and we can keep the Popeye sign as it should be. So on the left, uh, you see a patient with a, this bicep tendon rupture. You see the, the, the hematoma at the front of his arm and you see while we're rotating his forearm, nothing happens. So the biceps muscle belly doesn't go up and down and it should. So if the bicep tendon is still attached to the, to the radial tuberosity, the bicep tendon muscle, the belly should go up and down with passive rotation, obviously not active, but with passive rotation, should go up and down. At the more bloody images, you see a patient trying to commit suicide with glass and he failed, and he actually failed to cut any of his vital structures, luckily for him, but he did cut the biceps tendon, uh, sorry, the biceps muscle, nearly fully uh, through. But you see his tendon is still intact, and then when we rotate the form, you see how his, how his muscle belly is going up and down into the wound. So biceps tendon intact, muscle is torn. 
which is very rare, by the way. It's only it only happens in the case like these with uh, with sharp or a blunt uh, trauma directly onto the muscle. You can ask for an ultrasound if you want. Uh, patients like to have um, confirmation of your clinical exam, but really for the diagnosis of a complete bicep tendon rupture, that's not necessary. If there is a complete bicep tendon rupture, surgery is indicated. And uh, I say this quite, quite um, you know, with some force because I work in a um, in a good uh, in a good uh, center, both in London and in Antwerp, and I get secondary referrals of bicep tendon that have been missed or that have been treated conservatively. And we know from, uh, from history that 50% will do very poorly with uh, conservative treatment. And those patients do really poorly and they're very difficult to treat. So if you get them early, the first couple of weeks, the surgery is actually quite nice and it's easy to do. If you get them after six months, the tendon is all, um, is all um, adhered to, to all the, the other tissues, like for example, the brachial artery, like the nerves that are at the front of the elbow, and the uh, easy surgery in the beginning becomes very difficult surgery, and that's in 50% of cases. So unless the patient really doesn't want surgery or is not healthy enough for surgery, we tend to uh, steer them towards early fixation of this biceps tendon. As you can see here, we use a little button like Ali said, and uh, basically the same, the, the, the biceps tendon fixing, fixing the biceps tendon is so strong that they can start moving straight away in let's say 99% of cases, especially when you get them early. And this is what we do. It's a little bit faster than normal, but not a lot faster. Um, I was happy that Ali said that uh, the incision can't get smaller because your finger needs to fit. And that's exactly the same with the distal bicep. So uh, if my finger fits, that's about the size of the, uh, of the uh, incision. So we switch the bicep stand against that button. I then debride it. I debride it afterwards, not before, because when you start pulling, it always bunches up a little bit. And we don't want the button to be too far away from the bicep stand because I want the tendon not only the switcher, but I want the tendon to be in that hole that I'm drilling here. So we have a guide pin, extremely important. The arm, you can't see it from this video, but the arm's in hypersupination because there's a very important nerve at the back of the elbow, the motoric branch of the uh, radial nerves, the, the posterior interosseous nerve. And if you hit that with either your drill or with your button, the patient will never be able to extend their wrist again. And this is a uh, well-documented uh, um, com complication of this type of surgery. So hypersupination when you do this. Get a big needle, we use a, a guide pin from the ACL set uh, to go through the uh, other side of the elbow. This is blind, so there's no way of really knowing where the nerve is, except for your own knowledge. We know exactly where the nerve is, but we don't see it obviously. So pull on one, then flip it with the other, and it's exactly the same as a button in a shirt. It's uh, very, very strong. You can lift the arm straight away. You see, this is a big arm. We let them move immediately the day after surgery. And I tell my patients to, uh, uh, that they're able to lift to up to 20 kilos from day one. So my switches are so strong, the button is so strong, they're allowed to lift 20 kilos from day one. And most patients won't because it's gonna be painful and most patients are a little bit scared. But every once in a while I get, I get a patient who thinks it's a challenge instead of a, uh, instead of a warning. And they, uh, they actually, I've actually had patients lifting 20 kilos at, uh, you know, within the first two weeks after surgery, which I do not recommend. So that part is easy. This little bicep tendon rupture, full rupture, you get the Popeye sign, Forget, remember that, so the bicep tendon pulls up. Sometimes it doesn't pull all the way up if the laceptus fibrosis is still intact, which is a band that goes over the flexors of the, um, uh, of the forearm. If that one's still intact, then sometimes you do not get the typical Popeye sign, but you do get a positive hook test in general. So um, you might still be able to hook the bicep tendon, but it will feel loose. And especially when you compare it to the other side, you'll feel a difference between the two. Well, obviously those are missed more often than the typical ones, but that's not, not a huge problem because as long as the biceps tendon or the biceps muscle doesn't pull the tendon all the way up into the upper arm, then you can still get it down to the, to the tuberosity. So you have a little bit more time in patients where the, where the um, lacertus fibrosis is still intact. So surgery, uh, unless the patient is uh, medically unfit or really doesn't want surgery, but we do recommend it, results of surgery are you know, close to 100%. There are some complications in some cases, but very rare, relatively rarely. And um, patients do well, whereas if you have conservative treatment, up to 50% will do very poorly with both decreased strength and pain. And that's the most important one is the pain. They, they, they stay painful. And these are not patients that work behind a desk. Usually these are patients that are heavy manual laborers that need their arm to work and to live and to, uh, to earn money. 
And these are very bad patients to treat after six months. So this is more difficult. Those sites is tendinosis or partial rupture. They are more or less the same. Diagnostically very difficult. They have pain at the front of their arm. They might have weakness because of the pain. Up until uh, this year, there were no specific tests and ultrasound and MRI are usually not conclusive. So we can sort of see, okay, this might be burst sites, it might be tendinosis, there might even be partial rupture, but these are difficult patients. We developed the antro biceps test. It was published in the Journal of Hand Surgery this year. Uh, it's a two-part test. The elbow is in 70 degrees of flexion and the hand of the examiner is on the forearm. Make sure that the hand and wrist remain relaxed because if you pull, well, I'll show you how the test works. If you pull on the hand instead of on the forearm, and obviously you might get golfer's elbow, tennis elbow, you might get other pathologies involved in, uh, in having pain. So what we thought before we, um, before we did this study, we thought that uh, antero biceps test in supination, so resisted flexion, 70 degrees, forearm of supination would be less painful than resisted flexion with the forearm of pronation, and that's because of this. On the left, that's supination, on the right, that's pronation, uh, Raf, that's my son who drew this, uh, who drew these uh, these images. He'll be 22 tomorrow. So very old, but this is what happens in supination. The pathological tissue, which is always on the inside, on the bony side, um, is sort of free from the tuberosity. In pronation, that pathological tissue will be crushed against the tuberosity. And if you're asking yourself why. The drawing is really nice, but the green and the red, uh, is, it looks really amateuristic. That's because I did that part on the PowerPoint, so that's not the problem. This is a uh, endoscopic image, same patient. So on the left, supination, so the pathological tissue is clearly visible. On the right, you don't see the pathological tissue anymore because it's being compressed against the tuberosity. That's, this is the base of the antibiotics test. We looked at 30 patients with uh, distal biceps pathology, which was confirmed on MRI or surgical findings. No, um, very important, these were not uh, complete ruptures, because obviously complete ruptures actually not that painful in the beginning. And 30 patients with other pathology, where we did do a fast few MRI, obviously we didn't look surgically at the, um, at the biceps tendon. And what we found that literally in all patients, uh, supination was less painful than pronation. So resisted, Flexion, elbow in 70 degrees, resisted flexion in supinate with the forearm and supination was less painful than the forearm in pronation with all of them. And this was for the other pathologies for tennis elbow, golf elbow, uh, posterior interosseous nerve compression, uh, plica, et cetera. And as you can see, that's a, it's also a different slide. So here we went to, I think, seven or eight, whereas here we only go to two. So very little, very, not a lot of pain and uh, never, but that was maybe a coincidence, but never more pain in pronation than in supination. So although in our study we had the sensitivity and specificity of 100%, obviously that's, um, that's uh, you know, I'd love that to be true, but that can't be true. If we increase our series, we will get some false positives and false negatives, but in our series we didn't have one yet. Then we looked at uh, imaging because of the diagnostic uh, uh, problems. So we ultrasound very, very good in, um, with a good ultrasonographer, excellent, probably better than, than uh, MRI, however, it's uh, operator dependent. And when you get someone who doesn't really know what they're doing with ultrasound, uh, they might be very good with, uh, with the babies, but they might be very bad with the, with the musculoskeletal. Uh, if you don't know what they're doing, then, then you're sort of blind. MRI, we look at it ourselves, and this is the fat view. So when you do order an MRI for a suspect, suspected biceps tendon problem, so for uh, GPs or physios in the, in the audience, if you have an antero biceps test and you think it might be a biceps tendon problem and you order an MRI, order a FAPS view, which means flexion, abduction, supination. So it doesn't look very comfortable, but elbow MRIs unfortunately are never comfortable because the other position is Superman, which is more or less the same than with the arm straight. In this case, abduction of the shoulder, flexion of the elbow, and supination of the forearm. And you get the images that I'll show you later on, but you see the entire uh, biceps tendon. Despite the fact that this has been published quite a long time ago, no one ever actually looked at both positions. So no one looked at the differences between fab few and Superman positions. So we did with 50 biceps patients, 50 other pathologies. We asked our radiologists to grade it, tendinosis, partial tear, and uh, 25 percent, 25 to 50 and 50. Um, and we saw that the fab few was significantly better for grading the injury. 
So if you have an injury and you want to you want to know how bad the injury is, then a fab view is significantly better than a, a Superman view. And these are experienced radiologists. For, for uh, looking at biceps diagnosis, that didn't really matter. So you can you can diagnose the bicep tendon problem on a Superman view as well. Uh, however, it might be a little, a little bit less reliable, uh, but you can't create it on a Superman view. So, so still we think that the biceps fab view is better. Conservative treatment, we always send them to physio, we tell them to rest, we maybe give them some non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, we might do a, an injection, ultrasound injection of PRP or any other. Uh, um, we try not to use cortisone anymore, as you know, in the elbow. And expert opinion says minimum six months, but this is not, um, not really scientific. You know, and physio can often be very, very disappointing for both the physio and the, and the patient. Um, you know, we do our eccentric exercises, we, we try to get them stronger, but the bicep tendon is a very poor healer because of that bursa that's surrounding it, and it doesn't get a lot of uh, a blood supply. If conservative treatment fails for a minimum of six months, then we consider surgery. So definitely not before that. And when we do surgery, you can do this open or endoscopic. Endoscopic means with the camera. So um, and this is the way my patients are set up. Patients just lying relaxed on the back, on the arm table. We do the more or less the same incision and I stick my scope between the uh, tendon and the, uh, and the bone. And this is the view that you get. So at the bottom, you see the tendon. At the top, you see the tuberosity. So the bone of the tuberosity. We're trying to keep the, the bursa more or less intact so we can get some, some uh, um, dilation of the bursa so we can actually see something. These are the advantages. You get a magnified view, so times three and a half. And you don't need to pull on the tendon when you're, when you're actually looking at it. Where, whereas if you do an open incision and you go inside, you have to look at, you have to pull on the tendon quite hard because the pathology, like I said, is on the inside next to the bone. Small study that we, that we also published this year and was done with, uh, together with Lisa Gallitz in, in the US. And uh, we looked at tunnel placement and, um, and safety. And if you do this endoscopic, this, uh, this type of uh, surgery can be done as safe as, uh, as open. So there's not, not a huge difference. And this is a nice view. So on the, on the top, again, tuberosity. On the left, you see the bursa. And on the bottom, you see a really good, uh, nice looking biceps tendon. This one is a bit more nasty, you see here, that's also the tuberosity. You see the tenus synovitis, tuberosity. This would be one of those tuberosity that look, that look square on, the, on an x-ray. You can actually, you can actually shave them or, uh, or reshape them. And then we look at the tendon, there you go, in the supination, you just go into it and this tendon is very, very poor. This is what we do. So when we have an endoscopic view with less than 25% tear, we just simply do a debridement and let, let the tendon heal. If it's more than 25 but less than 50, we do an anchor. And if it's more than 50, we do a bone button as we do in a, uh, in a full repair. So we detach the tendon and then we do the bone button technique like I showed you before. If it's less than 50, uh, the tear is less than 50, but the quality of the tendon is really, really poor throughout, we still do the bone button. So our threshold to do the bone button is relatively low. So for those of you who are interested, this is what we do uh, on, uh, our, on our patients. So supine arm on the arm table. We make a two centimeter incision, about three centimeters distal to the elbow crease. We palpate the bicep tendon. These are not complete tears, so partial tears. So the bicep tendon is definitely palpable. Go in, we go in uh, uh, front because of the blood vessels at the front. I know this, these bleed quite a lot. And there is a little nerve there, the lateral anterobrachial cutaneous nerve that you do not want to cut because uh, that will create numbness in the forearm, which patients, uh, patients don't mind it too much. And usually it's temporary, but still, you know, it's, it's not as nice for the patient. So with the trocar, we go into the bursa or you can dissect a little bit further and just open the bursa with your, uh, with your scissors and then go in between the, the tendon, you see the tendon there and the bone. We use fluid to insufflate the, uh, the bursa. Don't worry too much about compartment syndrome, which is, might be one of the, you know, at least theoretical uh, complications of using fluid in the forearm. But the incision, as you can see, is big enough. So uh, I'm more worried about uh, wet shoes than I am about uh, uh, compartment syndrome. This is a patient with bursitis. And uh, this is why patients heal so poorly because they, they, they get their um, 
you get the nutrition via diffusion from the bursa. You see, there's no blood vessels in the tendon itself. And uh, if the bursa is sick, then the tendon will not be able to heal because it needs the bursa or at least the surroundings. See, almost no blood vessels in the tendon. Red and bursa, a lot of fluid usually when you go in uh, into a bursa like this, you get the fluid coming out. And just by removing the, the pathological bursa, these, uh, these heal quite nicely. This is more difficult. The partial tear, um, as you can see there, this is on the distal end of the, of the tendon. Small tear, um, doesn't look too bad, didn't look too bad on the, on the MRI, but this patient had pain for more than six months. So pain for more than six months, then you can think about surgery. So I tell my patients, listen, it's not necessary as long as it's not ruptured completely, but it is an option. And um, uh, obviously many patients don't like living with pain for longer than six months, and many patients will take that option. So this is a, uh, an example of a patient which is, uh, you know, the, the, the the tear is a little bit, little bit bigger. You start debriding it, and really after you debride it, then you can see the extent of the tear. On the right-hand side of the image, you see that we use retractors. And I think that's very important, especially when you start doing these. Use retractors, put your retractors in when you're working, because there's so many important structures right next to your biceps tendon that you do not want to kill them by being fancy with an technique. So retractors. Um, deep right the tendon, make sure it's ahead of your shaver and then you can easily use a little bone anchor um, for a nice repair. Similar case, this is a fab view. You see how uh, you get a view through the forearm and then uh, you can follow the tendon all the way up to the, to the actual biceps muscle. So you can, you can see the entire biceps tendon with the fab view. So again, deep right, you see how I keep my, uh, my shaver always in sight. And if, if I lose it or when I lose it, because you do, uh, every once in a while you don't see it anymore, stop shaving. Do not shave when you don't see your uh, see the head of your, um, of your shaver. Place an anchor. This is a so-called all suture anchor, so it's not metal. You can see how this uh, has a, uh, the tip of the suture has a, has a, a suture sort of sleeve all uh, around it. Then if you pull on it, the sleeve becomes a little ball and it's attached. The suture, the tendon, again, retractors as you can see at the bottom. Tied and not. These patients do well, but they take a long time to heal. So they take minimum three months to get better from, uh, from this surgery. Whereas if you do a, um, a full repair, so an endopathic repair, like I showed you before, those patients, they get better within about a month. So they, they're able to do nearly everything after a month. However, we feel that it's probably still better to uh, restore the anatomy if that's still an option, even though it takes a little bit longer. And this is an example of a partial tear. You see at the MRI, this again, the fast view MRI, you see a lot of fluid in the bursa, and then you see where the rupture of the tendon is. So this tendon is a very poor shape. And then when we really go in with our camera, I can't really find any healthy tendon anymore. It's, you know, this might still be intact, but you see how thin it is. It doesn't look like it can hold any load and all the rest of the tendon is, uh, is definitely torn. So then we detach the tendon. That's actually the scariest part of, uh, of the surgery in, in my opinion. Detach a tendon there. We're doing this uh, open, and then we do exactly the same as what we did earlier with the biceps tendon uh, button treat, uh, button uh, technique. So in conclusion, bursitis, tendonitis, or partial tears, do the anterior biceps test. It doesn't differentiate between a partial tear or bursitis or tendonitis, but at least it'll show you that you have a distal biceps tendon problem. Um, if you feel that you want to get, uh, you know, want to know a little bit more about that problem, you get a fab few MRI. We tend to wait a little bit with the MRI now because we're so happy with the test. And the reason why we do MRI, we do MRI if we're contemplating surgery. So only then do we ask for an MRI and not necessarily before. Conservative treatment, obviously, um, as long as the patient wants to, but it's at a minimum of six months. And if this fails, you can do what we tend to do, a biceps tendon endoscopy where we deep right, repair or reinsert. Thank you. So, Thanks, Roger. Great talk. Great. There, there are so many patients out there who have, um, um, you know, distal biceps, tendinosis, and so on. And uh, as you quite rightly said, you know, quite a few of them respond well with non-operative treatment. Um, but when they don't, you know, you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. Um, and, and the solution that you have is fairly elegant. 
I mean, I can I can think of a few patients that I could send you your way for that, for sure. Um, I think there are a few uh, questions, uh, Jack, are there? Yes, so there are a couple of questions. Um, Roger, this one is, do you think there could be a mechanical impingement etiology for the partial biceps rupture and tendonitis? tendonitis? This question is from Karim Bilsell. Yes, Karim, thank you for the, uh, thank you for joining us, first of all, and uh, thank you for the question. I think definitely there's a mechanical impingement etiology. Uh, um, most of my patients are not big bodybuilders. There are obviously a few of them where the etiology maybe lies in uh, overuse and abuse of, uh, of substances. But um, mainly patients are 45 year old people, a little bit overweight, smokers with a, with a heavy job lifting all day. And, um, you know, as I showed with the, with the biceps test, when you're in pronation and you're then lifting, you definitely have some impingement against that uh, tuberosity. And then if you do get some bony changes, because you get some, some reaction from this um, and you get some bony change, then impingement is extremely important. So um, I didn't show you this in this talk, but we do do a, um, when, when the tuberosity looks as bad as the one I showed you in the endoscopy, we do uh, get rid of the, all the osteophytes in the, uh, of the tuberosity because otherwise we feel that we do a repair and you end up with the same impingement type problem again and, and pain and maybe even uh, a re-rupture of your tendon. So uh, yes, definitely. Okay, there's another question from Satya Vamsi who says, some studies say biceps footprint is little behind, difficult to reach it anteriorly, any tips or it doesn't matter? Yes, that's uh, also uh, uh, an excellent question. And I would say not some studies say biceps tendon footprint is a little bit behind, all studies would say that. And um, as you can see from my endoscopy, well, you, you have a quite a big tuberosity that you can see in the bursa, so it's surrounded by the bursa and the bicep tendon is always at the back of that tuberosity. And the tuberosity probably works as a cam um, uh, for increased strength in supination and pronation, uh, towards supination, obviously. Um, I'm not 100% sure if it matters. Clinically, we know that patients will regain, if you do an endo endobutton repair, we know that they regain a uh, minimum 95% of their supination strength and they go up to 100 and sometimes even more uh, in flexion strength and, and there's a bias there because uh, usually it's the dominant arm. So that's why uh, the, the operated arm is stronger than the non-operated arm. But they do regain their flexion strength. They do little, they lose a little bit of supination strength. And that's probably because we do a non-anatomical repair. So I said we hypersupinate, but still then I aim towards more or less the, <coughs> uh, the center of the tuberosity slightly more ulnarly, because it's if, if you hypersupinate, it's not it's no longer posterior, but it becomes ulnar. Slightly more ulnarly, but um, uh, definitely not non-anatomical. We're now working on a uh, biceps tendon button, uh, which is uh, intramedullary. Uh, so hopefully in the, in the future, uh, we'll, uh, we'll be able, we've only been doing biomechanical studies, anatomical studies. As you know, by elbow is not very commercial. So we don't, uh, we don't, we haven't found a company that wants to, uh, uh, wants to commercialize it yet, but um, um, we think that if you get an, an endomedullary repair, you get the advantages of an button and you get an anatomical, um, uh, anatomical footprint repair. Why don't we use anchors? Because you can do that with an anchor as well. That's because the loading, the immediate loading that's possible with the endo button, it's so much bigger than an anchor. So when you have an anchor, there's always a little bit of lag. So you pull on it and they always lose some of the connection between the biceps tendon and the, uh, and the bone. Um, whereas with an endo button repair, the biceps tendon is in the bone. You get ingrowth of bone onto the, uh, onto the uh, tendon, which is a huge, very, very strong repair. So uh, we prefer to have immediate mobilization, immediate strength, which is not possible with other types of devices at the moment, but hopefully with the intermediate we button it will. Okay, that's it, thank you. Thank you. Fantastic guys. I think guys, that's, uh, if there, unless there are any other questions, I'm just having a look. We've answered all the questions. Um, this talk will be available on our YouTube channel over the next few days. There are lots of other talks that we've already done there, so please feel free to have a look. Um, all of you can contact us directly um, for any questions, etc. Um, thank you all for attending. Thank Jack, you. don't forget to stop the recording. Yeah.